with us. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us. We want to welcome those that are joining us online and express our gratitude to each and every one of you for taking time to be with us this evening. I again want to thank everyone for your faithful stewardship uh, in, in continuing to give to the work of the Lord through this church and uh, different ways you can give. Uh, and we'll have that for you, make that information available for you, and you can continue to be faithful stewards. And it's such a blessing, amen, uh, that, uh, that you have been so, so dedicated to, uh, to the kingdom of God through all that we've been through in the last year. Amen. Praise God. I want to talk to you tonight about victory in your tough times. Victory in your tough times. And tonight, just going to basically reinforce what we have been talking about. Life doesn't have to break you. Even in your tough times, victory is available. Amen? Now, we'll get to 2 Chronicles in chap uh, chapter 20 in a moment. 2 Chronicles 20 in a moment if you want to pull out your device and look it up or if you want to uh, have your Bible, whatever you want to do, or you're going to read some of the scriptures that we have on the screen, that will be fine. But I, I want to talk to you tonight about that, that very important thought, because most of us know what it is to go through tough times. Uh, we know what it is to face incredible odds. We know what it is to have the numbers stacked against you, uh, to, to stare at an overwhelming situation in, in a sense, to have your back against the wall or to feel as though you're cornered. Most of us can identify with that. Amen. Now, again, I know we're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, but, but I want us to think, think, think for just a moment as we consider some of the, the stories found in the book of Judges. It, it contains stories of those that faced seemingly impossible odds. First of all, I think of Deborah in chapter Four, and I'm not going to spend time on these, but I just want to bring it out. This is the God we serve, okay? I, we've got to start there. This is the God we serve. He's the same God today. Here's Deborah. She is a, a prophet. She is uh, used of God. She is a leader at this time in the nation of uh, Israel's uh, uh, history, and uh, God raises her up. And she is like many others. There is an insufficiency in her weaponry. The odds are stacked against her, yet she experiences victory. Then I think about Shamgar. Now get this, 600 to 1. Shamgar, in the book of Judges, chapter 5, it taught just very few lines given to Shamgar. 600 to 1 Shamgar picks up an ox goad and takes on 600 Philistines and slays them. Uh, it wasn't the ox goad, friends. It was the Spirit of God that came upon him that brought victory that day. A, a, an ox goad is, is a wooden tool that's approximately eight feet long. It's got a, a point on one end to where they can prod the oxen to keep them moving forward, and then many times a blade on the other end where they can keep the plow uh, clear of debris as they work the soil. So here it is with a farming implement that Shamgar, under the Spirit of God, slays 600 Philistines. And then what about Gideon? Think about Gideon. It would have been something if God would have allowed him to maintain his 32,000 man army. Amen. 32,000 fighting men. That represented odds of four to one against the Israelites. I don't know about you, but that, that seems bad enough. Four to one. Four guys to one of mine. That, that's tough odds. But that wasn't enough. Get this. God, they dropped the number from 32,000 down to 10,000. Now the odds are 12 to 1. And God's saying, no, you still got too many, Gideon. And Gideon's scratching his head and saying, no, I don't know about all that. Amen. Don't tell him we, we, we don't try to reason with God. And Gideon may have done the exact same thing. God basically says, too many. God, 
Next has Gideon bring the men to the water and observe how they drink. And from this test, God directs uh, Gideon to send 9,700 men home. And he's left with 300 men against 120,000 warriors from the east. And, and if you're counting, that is 400 to 1. And God says, just right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo, that's the God we serve. See, now we're going to look at one of the Old Testament passages that deals with a, a battle that, 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 that I draw life lessons from. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 20. God's chosen people, the Israelites, found themselves really in an impossible situation. The Israelite king Jehoshaphat got a message one day that there were three armies on their way to destroy Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to start at the first verse. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the Meunites came to make war with Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you. Now, the first feeling would be a feeling of being alarmed. Let's just get real. You've got three armies coming against your one army. You've got a vast uh, gathering of opposing forces coming against you. What a problem that is staring them now in the face. Can you imagine three armies against one dealing with a situation that seems unfair and impossible? Anybody ever been there? Dealing with a situation unfair and impossible. Facing a problem so big where you're greatly outnumbered. That's where King Jehoshaphat finds himself. Maybe it's a job loss and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills. A loved one's been touched by an unexpected illness. A person's checkbook shows more withdrawals than deposits. Amen. Person dealing with... God help me right now. A person dealing with a secret addiction that you just can't seem to break free from. Confronted with a challenge where there's no answer. So in, in, you see, in, in life, you can just start to feel totally overwhelmed just like King Jehoshaphat. See, King Jehoshaphat found himself in an unfair, in an impossible situation, and he had to make a choice. And that's something we have been trying to talk about. You have a choice. You don't have to give in. You don't have to give up. See, see it would have been very, easily for King, uh, very easy for King Jehoshaphat to freak out. Could have got angry. Been fearful. He could have even questioned God. But if you study this, King Jehoshaphat didn't do any of those things. He made a better choice. Look at what the scripture uh, uh, tells us that he did. He, 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 uh, look at this. And, and it's something that we should do. First thing I want you to see is rely on God's power. Rely on God's power. Amen. He looked to God and this is what he prayed. He said, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are God, are the God who is in heaven. You're the God that's in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You're powerful and mighty. Look at this. No one, nothing can stand against you. Hallelujah. See, look at that. I mean, okay, they come in. Hey, king, we've got an issue here. You've got three armies coming against you. I mean, panic very easily could have set in. Freaking out could have very, been, very much been his response. Amen. Fear, doubt, questions, all of that. But you know what he does? He relies on God. Look, I know I see that, but there is a greater force, a more real power that's available to me. Hallelujah. You see what he's doing? He's recalling that God has more power than his enemy. 
And in so doing, he is revealing his reliance on God's power. Hallelujah. Listen, time for many times our speech reveals where our confidence lies. Amen. And I look at Jehoshaphat. This news is fresh to Jehoshaphat. It's real. And what's he do? He looks to God and he prays. You, God of our ancestors, you're the one that is alone in heaven. You're the ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful. You're mighty. No one can stand against you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, when we encounter a Red Sea, rely on God's power. When we encounter massive walls of hindrance, rely on God's power. When we encounter seasons of insufficiency, rely on God's power. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't panic. Don't live in fear. Rely on God's power. King Jehoshaphat goes on. He didn't stop there. Look at what else he says. Oh, and I love this. Oh, our God. It's a little bit like David in Psalm 63. God, you're my God. And, and, and King Jehoshaphat reminds himself of that connection. God, you're the one that's in heaven, but you're also our God. Hallelujah. Oh, our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? You know, again, what he's doing, he not only relies on God's power, but the second thing he does, again, the same thing we need to do. When we find our back against the wall, we're in a corner. The numbers are against us. Same thing. Rely on God's power. The second thing is this. Rest in God's promises. Hallelujah. Rest in God's promises. King Jehoshaphat was remembering. Listen, he said, I remember back, God, you're the one that drove out the the ones that opposed in the first place. And you did that because you promised this land to the, not just to Abraham, but to the descendants of Abraham. Hallelujah. You promised this for future generations. It didn't stop with one generation. And I'm a part of that lineage and that promise that you made to Abraham is a promise that still speaks into my need right now. Whew. Hallelujah. He not only declared his reliance on God's power, King Jehoshaphat was remembering God's promises to, uh, and reminding them uh, to the people, the Israelites, and, and he is declaring again his reliance not only on God's power, but his reliance on God's promises. Not only can I trust God's power, but I can take God at his word. Amen. Amen. Jehoshaphat is declaring his reliance on God's promises, which is a revelation of his confidence in God's faithfulness. Hallelujah. We can do the same thing. Listen, God has promised many things to us in the Word, in the Bible. When we are encountering forces that have come against us, we can rest in God's promise that God is for us. And if God be for us, who? Just like Jehoshaphat said, he said, look, they might be able to come against us, but they'll not be able to remain standing when they come against you. Hallelujah. 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 When we're lonely, we can rest in God's promise that he'll never leave us or forsake us. But he go with us all the way to the end. When we're weak, I'm, I'm going to just stop here. Anybody ever encounter those forces coming against you? Anybody here ever encounter that times of loneliness? 
Anybody here ever, ever feel as though they're weak? When we encounter those things in weakness, we can rest in God's promise to be our strength. When you're weak, I'll reveal my strength to you. Man, I've looked around at some people through the number of years that I've been pastoring, and they have remained, they've remained standing when they have been hit by some pretty tough blows. And the only things that make sense is the reinforcing strength of God that enabled them to stand when they should have fallen. Amen. Amen. Should have been knocked down, should have been knocked out, but here they are still standing. Stand, therefore, in the whole armor. Hallelujah. God's promises are true. I want you to get this. God's never broken a promise. When God promises something, we can count on him to always come through. And that's what King Jehoshaphat knew. He rested in God's promises. Okay. I don't want to get off track, but this is what the Lord put in my spirit today. He... He rested in God's promise. Let me ask you something. Have you ever experienced being in the midst of so much confusion and noise that you couldn't even hear yourself thinking? Amen. I've heard, Anthony, I've heard people say this. I've said, please be quiet. I can't even hear myself think. I can't keep my train of thought because there's so many distracting and conflicting noises and voices what the enemy wants to do to us to disrupt our ability to be reminded and rest in the promises of God you can't even hear your own thoughts listen there'll be times that you'll need to turn the world's volume down so that you can hear God's voice and hear God's promises amen hallelujah there are times that God's word has to compete with all the other noises and all the other voices fighting for your attention. I've been there where I've even tried to kneel beside the couch or the, my bed or whatever, and still there are so much conflicting noises and voices that are creating conflict and confusion. But the moment I say, no, be still. Be still and turn that. All of a sudden, it's as though that, that, that God's word comes breaking forth and his promises wash through me, reminding me that I can rest in those promises. See, what we've done is we like activity. And many times it's activity for the sake of activity. We just want to keep ourselves busy. You know why? Sometimes we do it because we don't want to think. Come on. Amen. Look at what Jesus did. Look at his example in Luke 5, 16. This is the Amplified Bible. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray in seclusion. Why? Everybody wanted a piece of him. Amen. Amen. They wanted his focus. They wanted his attention. But Jesus saw the importance of turning the world's volume down and being alone with the Father. That's what... Mm. Listen, it is in that place of prayer that the volume of the noises and voices of this world of our adversaries are turned down and God can be heard with clarity. Do you understand how important that is? It is in that place of seclusion that, that fresh supplies of light and revelation and power are received. Hallelujah. And many had been there, been so drained, so weak, so frustrated, but you made yourself get to that place where you were alone with God and all of a sudden God's light 
His revelation, His power washes over your mind and your life. And there is renewal and there is refreshing. There is a refurbishing takes place. You get up and you're renewed. Amen. We need those fresh supplies. We need those fresh supplies of divine light, divine revelation, and divine power. I want to say something else too. We can't give out what we haven't taken time to receive first. I can't give out something I haven't received. And if I haven't taken time to be alone with God and receive that light, to receive that revelation, to receive that power, I can't give it out. Friends, let me tell you something. You're not alone in this world. There are people all around you that need to get glimpses of that light, get glimpses of that revelation, get glimpses of that power, and you cannot give out of you what you have not, first of all, received. Amen. And listen, we're to be channels. We're not to be a dam. We're to be a channel through which God's light, power, revelation flow. Amen. And it is in those promise or in those private times with God that the promises of God are reinforced in our lives. Uh, can I, I just want to get real with you for a second. There are times, even times when we've had prayer meetings here at the church that I've had just so much going on, so many different people wanting my focus, wanting my attention, wanting to give me their needs. And, and I know that's what I'm here for. But then we're going to go into a prayer meeting I, I, first of all, and I hope nobody gets offended by this, but, but there, I've got to have an element of moment where I clear. Okay, it's yours, God. I'm transferring all that. What I need right now is clarity. I need to clear the clutter. I don't mean that to be offensive, but there are times we just need to clear the clutter. We get so much buildup. I've used this illustration before. But on occasion, what you need to do is check your battery cables because if corrosion gets between the post and the cable, then the car is not going to start and you're not going to have any power. What you got to do every once in a while is get in the presence of God and let God clean that clutter, clean that corrosion where the connection is clean. And the power flows freely. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, what Jehoshaphat did next was totally amazing. What he did next was totally amazing. Okay. He's relying on God's power, and he is resting in God's promises. I, I, I don't want to wear that thought out. But how many times have we gone to bed unable to go to sleep and get good rest? Because our minds on everything else. I have found myself doing this again and again, simply rehearsing the Word of God. Just people say, count sheep. No, I, I rehearse the Word of God because the Word of God's powerful. Amen. It cuts through. <laughs> Praise God. So he relies on God's power. He rests on God's promises. Well, there's just so much there. When you look at how the odds are stacked against him, how overwhelmed he could have felt, he relies on God's power, and he rests in God's promises. But again, that next thing, Jehoshaphat told singers, to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising Him. Look at what it says. Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord, to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Now, can you believe that? 
It's not the archers. It's not the ones that, that have the swords. It's not the ones with the spears. It's not the one with the shields. It's the singers. It's the worshipers that are leading them into battle. Because they're not relying on themselves and their ability and power. They're relying on God's power, resting in God's promises. Therefore, they remember our primary purpose is to praise God. Is that not our primary purpose? To praise Him? Amen. He puts the choir out front. How many pastors or music directors say, Hey, choir, get yourselves ready. You're leading us in the battle. And that's what Jehoshaphat does. They're not trained fighters. They're not soldiers. They're singers. They sang, and they sang, and they sang praise to God. They worshiped him. Why? Because they knew God was the only one who could bring them victory. I want to I stop right here and say something to you, and I love you. But you ought to be praising God irregardless of the style of the song that we're singing. Doesn't matter if it's a hymn or a, or a new worship song. We sang both tonight, so that should have caught everybody. Come on. We get so hung up. and You know what we've done? Oh, I'm going to preach for a minute. We've made church about entertainment, and entertainment is about us being pleased, us being satisfied, when worship isn't about us. Worship is about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm not doing it where I'll get happy. I'm doing it where I please God. See, what we've done through these years is we've turned church into an entertainment center. Mm. We'll draw them as long as we entertain them. What we've done in many places, we've increased the singing and diminished the Word of God. Well, I'm preaching okay. Oh, yeah, we need the songs and we need the worship. But I want to tell you something. Worship isn't just about the singing and the songs and the music. Worship, preaching is worship. Amen. And the Word is the sword of the Spirit. Come on, help me right now, friends. Remember to worship God. And worship doesn't switch off when the singers stop. Worship continues through the whole service. Amen. My wife said, get your praise on. Why? We need some. When we start church, we're heading into battle. We need the singers to go forth in front of us because when we worship God as we go into battle, we realize it's not our power or ability or authority, but we are totally reliant on God. And that's what our praise and worship signifies. Amen. Listen, God's the only one that can bring us victory what we need to do we remember God's power we remember God's promises we rely on God's power we rest in God's promises friends we need to worship I love every one of you and maybe this isn't the crowd I need to be talking to but I'm going to go ahead and put it out there there's times for the musicians and singers to get people engaged in worship is too hard a work. It shouldn't be work to get people to worship God. There ought to be enough of us born again, spirit-filled believers that come together and just say, I love Him. 
I know what I've been battling. I know the odds are against me. I know what I'm trying to work myself through right now. But God is still God, and I'm going to worship him. I'm going to rely on his power. I'm going to rest in his promises, and I'm going to remember. I'm going to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember to worship God. You wouldn't think singing and worshiping God could actually do anything to win a battle. Come on. Worshiping and singing? But look at what Scripture says. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. <laughs> Praise God. The soldiers didn't even have to fight because the worshipers led the battle. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The battle's not yours. The battle belongs to God. Your praise and worship declare your reliance on God, your recognition of God. Amen. The moment, the moment they started singing, look at that, verse 22, as they began to sing, praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. The moment, the moment they started singing and worshiping, the Lord ambushed. The armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they were defeated. Whew. I'm telling so. you know what you need to do, right? Well, pastor, you just don't know what's coming against me. You know what's going on in my life. You don't know the trouble. You don't know the turmoil. You don't know what I'm going. I'll tell you what you need to do right now. You need to rely on God's power. You need to rest in God's promises. And first and foremost, you need to remember to worship God. By the time, I, I just, this story just blows my mind. By the time they got to the place where the battle was supposed to take place, the battle was already over. Already over, their enemy's already dead. That's the power of worship. I'm not making it up. Go home, read it. If you, Second Chronicles chapter 20, read down through there. Start at the first verse. It's the word of God. That's the power of worship. And I want somebody to get that. You and I can have the same exciting results. When we're in a battle, all we have to do is to begin to, with praise and worship, focus on the one who wins the battle. Come on. When we find ourselves, let, let's just get real for a second. When we find ourselves under attack, if we're not careful, the first feelings we begin to experience are fear, panic, dread, uncertainty, bewilderment. Come on. We begin to feel those things running through our mind. Our first response, our first response should be, we're going to praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God brings victory in the midst of our worship. And I want you to get this. Authentic worship begins with a true vision of the living God. Authentic worship takes place of a, with a true, begins, I'm sorry, authentic worship begins with a true vision of the living God. When you see the living God for all that he is, all of his majesty, all, you're not going to be able to refrain from praising him. But I've been talking about this church over the last few weeks. I've mentioned this. Authentic worship begins with a true vision of the living God, and the word of God gives us that true vision of God. All I've got to do is begin to read Genesis through Revelation, and I get to, to have an authentic an authentic uh, uh, vision of God when I read the Word of God. 
Okay, this is what happens. Our adversary wants us to lose heart by distorting our vision of God as we interpret God through the lens of our circumstances. I've been talking about that. When I look at God through the lens of my circumstances, I'll be like the ten spies. We're grasshoppers. But whenever I look and have a true revelation of the living God, I'll be like Joshua and Caleb and say, we're well able to take this land. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to go on. I want to say something else. Because there are people. There are people that feel as though they, they've got to hide the reality of their problem. They've got to keep themselves. But I want you to hear me. Being honest about our battles does not diminish the reality and authority of our God. Jehoshaphat recognized the reality of the situation. But in his mind and eyes, it didn't diminish the reality and authority of God. Yes, Ammon is out there. Yes, Moab is out there. Yes, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Mount Seir is out there. They're all out there. I, I get that. But what's he do? He looks up. I've said this a few times, but you'll never be able to battle your problems until you're honest about those. You'll never overcome an addiction. Come on. Whatever it may be, until you're honest about it. Being honest about that does not diminish the reality and authority of God. As I reflect on the odds against King Jehoshaphat and God's people, I think of how they may have been questioning God instead of worshiping God. I've, I've encountered those because they see their problems. And instead of worshiping God, they begin to question God. It is in those seasons of adversity, those moments of despair and discouragement that we need to remember, let's worship God. Hallelujah. As long as we remember that God's the one who wins the battle, our worship is easy. Listen, the battle or situation that you're in, it's not yours. It's not yours. It's God's. Turn it over to Him. I said something a few weeks ago, and, and people are still, and I, I want you to come to me and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm just trying to remind people. Because they said, well, I've talked to God about this. I've prayed to God about this. But I still, but I still, but I still. I said, well, what you're not doing is what I, I want to encourage you to do. You haven't actually transferred the burden. You haven't actually transferred the burden. Look, I, I, the honest reality of your, of your situation, I get that. But the honest reality of your situation doesn't diminish the reality and authority of God. What you really need to do is when you talk to God about it, transfer the burden of it. Cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. Not always the easiest thing to do. But you've got to turn it over, actually transfer the burden. And, and I want to remind you of something. Many times miracles happen when we're down to nothing. When you understand that God is your source, nothing is impossible. With man it may be impossible, but with God all things are possible. Hallelujah. Now, I, I believe in this service what I'm preaching is ministering to someone, building someone up in their faith for the miraculous provision that God has for you. Amen. Will you give me just a few more moments, okay? Because I want to make a distinction here. What do you do when you're overtaken by your problems? What do you do when you feel like you're hemmed in and you don't have any more options? 
feel as though you're overtaken, I just want to remind you right now, you may feel like you're overtaken, but you're not forsaken. Amen. It may look like you're out. What do you do? You know what we have a tendency to do in our own minds? and spirits? We have a tendency to look for options. We want an option here. An option defined is as being something chosen and alternative, different pathways to the same destination. We're, a, we're an option-oriented society. We need, we want options. Amen. If we're going to buy a car, what's one of the first things we ask? What are the options? Amen. If we're buying insurance, we want to find out the options. If we're facing a medical problem, we go in and we sit down and we talk to the doctor. What do I do about it? What are my options? We all want options. But instead of looking at it that we want options, I want to throw another word out. I want to throw another word, the word opportunity. The word opportunity means circumstances that are favorable for a purpose to be accomplished. An opportunity means a good chance to advance yourself, a good moment to accomplish something. Listen, you may have run out of options, but somewhere in your circumstances is a hidden opportunity to see God's power revealed in your life. You don't need to look for options. What you need to do is look at your problem as another opportunity for God to show himself. not looking for another way out. I'm looking for God to show me his power in what I'm going through. When God's going to do something powerful in your life, the opportunity will work for you. Now, many are frustrated because they feel as though they don't have any options. Listen to me. When you have options... You're trying to retain control. When you run out of options, that's when God's ultimately in control. See, sometimes being with your back against the wall is a place God wants you and needs you so he can show you what he's able to do. I mean, we see it, don't we? Red Sea in front of them. Pharaoh's army coming uh, up against them. They're trapped. What does God do? They're looking for options. No. God provides an opportunity for them to cross through on dry ground. And when the sea came back together, their adversary was swallowed up and defeated. Stop trying to be in control. And let God be in control. When you reach a point when you're being overtaken or overwhelmed by your circumstances, I want to remind you again, you're not forsaken by God. I believe this. And Darla and I have seen it time and time again. God is about to show himself strong on your behalf. Divine opportunity. Glenda, would you come back to the piano for just a moment? I want you to hear me, please. I've been talking about this over the last several weeks, even over a month or more probably now. Focus. Focus is of vital significance. And I want to encourage somebody, focus on God, not your problems. I mean, that's a simple thing, but focus on God, not your problems. And I want to remind you of something. Focus isn't just a visual thing. Focus is also a mental thing. What am I focusing on with my thoughts? Remember, the set of your mind determines the direction of your life. We've been talking about that. Focus on God, not your problems. Focus isn't just a visual thing. It is also a mental thing. I want to show you one more verse, verse 12 in, in 2 Chronicles 21 more. Look at this. We, 
we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We, we can't. We don't know what to do. What an ignore. That's being real, isn't it? But the reality of their problem doesn't diminish the reality and authority of God. We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do. But look at what he says. Where, where is their focus? Where's their focus? Our eyes are on you. Hallelujah. 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 Our focus is on you. Our eyes are on you. Now, I've, t I've told you this. On different occasions. Darla and I are not immune to the feelings that you experience. We can we can feel dread, we can feel panic. We can feel those things. Experience the reality of those things. We're not superhuman. But what we found out through the years is if we stay focused on all that then that gr gains greater control of our lives amen but if we focus on God look we don't have the power to face them we don't have the power to, to, to do anything we don't know what to do but we do know this we're going to look to God Whew. man Darla, how many times, how many times have we been down to nothing, wondering what are we going to do? We don't have the power. We don't have the strength. We don't have the ability. We don't have the resources. But there's one thing we can do. We can keep our eyes on God. I want to encourage somebody tonight. The realities of pain, problems, and heartache, that they're out there. But they don't diminish the reality and authority of your God. Listen to me. Don't give up. Look up. Don't give up. Look up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet this evening? Wow. Wow. Because of our position, Darla and I are constantly made aware of things people are going through. And there's only one thing that we know to do. Just tell them. My wife reminded me of this today. And we, we've got to where we purposefully do this. Because it's easy to tell somebody, well, we'll pray for you. It's easy to tell someone, well, we'll intercede for you. And when I respond to somebody or, or Darla responds to somebody, we'll look at one another and we say, if we're telling them we're doing it, we're going to do it. Amen. Somebody contacted us today with a real battle going on in their lives. And my wife sent back to them. We're interceding for you. You know, listen, you don't have to say things out loud. God knows the thoughts. And there are different times I found myself in my thoughts Focusing on their needs, focusing on their battle, lifting them to God today in prayer. I want to encourage you, don't give up, look up. We're praying for you. And when we tell you we're doing that, we're doing it. When we tell you we're interceding, Somebody else contacted me about a loved one that's having some health issues. I sent back, we're praying. My wife was already at work. I forwarded her and said, let's pray. Man, I'm serious about this. I want to see people experience victory through their tough times. I want to see some people that will praise God in their tough times. It's one thing to praise God when you're on the mountain. 
It's another thing to praise God when you're going through the valley. And there's some folks here tonight, you're going through a valley, but what you need to do right now is you need to praise God in the valley. When you do, God will turn the tide. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Man, I have felt the word of the anointing of God on his word tonight. Hallelujah. I pray to God this has made sense. I hope it's spoken to somebody. All I can do is speak what the Lord puts in my spirit. I believe this has encouraged someone. I do. Somebody's walking out of here. Their head held high. Hey, I may still be going through this battle, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to look up. That's what Jehoshaphat did. If you go back and read this, when he got that news, it says he stood up there by the tabernacle of God, and he lifted, and he began to talk to God. In other words, I could let this get me down, but I'm not. I'm going to look up. And I just want to encourage somebody tonight. Don't give up. Look up. Don't give up. Look up. Hallelujah. God is in control. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray right now. Your will be done. Your will be done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want to take just a moment. I want to take just a moment. Thank you all for being with us today. We appreciate you tuning in and being with us in service. We hope that something was said or done that did something to minister to your heart as it did ours. And we pray that you have a blessed week ahead. God bless you. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Remember, you can give online at brookportcog.com or you can mail your gift to the address below. Thanks so much for watching. See you again.